preacher. He is a blessing. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. I want to read to you a few verses this morning, and let's start in verse number 14. The Bible says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we are all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and arose again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these verses that we're going to study and preach. probably five or six brand new Bibles mailed to me from friends all over the country. This is one of them. Uh, this beautiful red uh, Schuyler King James Bible that was given to me. I've got a green one. I've got a blue one. I've got a black. You know, I've got them all colors, shapes, and size. I love them. And I just pick one and preach out of it, and, and they all have a, a feel. But the first thing, when I open that Bible up, I smell it. Oh, I love it. And you know, this one still has that smell. They ought to make a cologne with it called Bible smell. And I, I'd probably spray that on real good, smell like the Bible. And uh, you know, I love new things. I, I love them. Now there's some, I, I'm a lover of old things. I, I like to go antique shopping. I was telling uh, this sweet couple back here about this little sign. Uh, they, they thought we were in revival, which really in the month of August we kind of are. It's like a month-long Tuesday night revival. And uh, But uh, this sign... Uh, came out of my office. Matter of fact, this was the only thing in the office that made it. And it was actually hanging up on the side of the wall. There you can tell it's, it's kind of charred up a little bit. Some of the men cleaned some of it up. And, 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 and some of the men built uh, some of this up here. And they said, Preacher, let's just stick that sign on the back wall. It'll kind of match everything. And it'll remind us of where we've been and where we're going. And you know what? One thing the devil cannot destroy is revival. I don't think it's a coincidence. This sign doesn't have some kind of special something on it. It's just the thought behind it is, you know, and I love old things. I found this in an old barn in Asheville years ago in the corner of an old barn. It was nasty and dirty, and, and we cleaned it up, and, and, and I took it and put it in my house for a while. I've used it for sermon illustrations. I've carried it all over the country preaching on revival and what God wants to do. Little did I know that it'd be hanging behind me one day as I'm uh, standing up here preaching to you. I love old things. You come to our house, you'll find a bunch of antiques. Matter of fact, you'll think you're in an antique shop. And uh, we have people stop off the road sometimes and say, Joel, did y'all uh, restore an old house? I said, no, it's a brand new house. Because we're a lover of old things. I love old trucks. I got a 67 pickup sitting there in my driveway that we're working on. It's a, it is a work, a piece of work, and uh, but it's old. And uh, you know what? We're trying to restore it back to drivable condition. Hey, I love old things, but thank God that we're new creatures in Christ. Amen. Because the old man, hey, listen, there's some things that Paul would like to forget. Unfortunately, we couldn't forget. He couldn't forget. And this experience was so revolutionary in Paul's life that he employs some unusual language to describe his spiritual transformation. Now, many of you in here today remember what you used to be. Many of you do. You know, I, I'm thankful that I got saved as a young teenage boy, 13 years old. I, I, got a, I was raised in a godly home. I was never, by the grace of God, never involved in what I would call gross sin, wicked sin, out here, uh, you know, strung out on something or overdosed on this or drunk and don't remember where I was. None of that ever happened. I was, I was raised in a godly home. Uh, it doesn't make me better than anybody. It was just the grace of God. It could have been kept me from that. And the same grace that saves us, the same grace that keeps us. Amen. So I was raised in a good home. But I needed salvation just like the drunk on the street needed it. And there's some that remembers the day that you got saved. And you remember what you used to be. I think about my granddad. My granddad's 80, 88 years old. My granddad for most of his life was nothing but an old sod, an old drunk. He'd run off, run. He'd be missing three or four days. My grandma wouldn't know where he's at. He worked in the coal mines of West Virginia for 40-some years and made pretty decent money there for the unions, but he'd drink it all away. Man, it was just, just rough. 
One night he knew that he needed God and he, he went down to the Baptist church and he knocked on the door of that Baptist church and, and uh, the preacher happened to be at the church that evening. It was rare, but God had it all set up that evening and, and, and God knew that he would be there. My dad, my granddad knocked on that door and the preacher came. He said, what are you doing here, Ray? And he said, preacher, I came to talk. He said, what are you want? Man, it was a set to have Ray Cox at the doorstep of the church we've been praying for. My grandpa that night came down to the altar and, and the preacher said, Ray, what do you need? And he said, I need Jesus. And my granddad got saved. And can I tell you, uh, as much as he was going 100 mile an hour for the devil, he went 100 mile an hour for God. He stopped the drinking, stopped the cursing, stopped the running around. And, and listen, for the last 25 years, my granddad's been serving Jesus. Amen. Hey, he remembers that old man, but thank God, hey, he is a new creature in Christ. And I believe Paul here is talking about that. Notice that the, the, the language that he uses here in verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then, we, then we're all dead. Look at verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose Again, I think the first thing we come to, and I'm going to hasten, but the first thing we come to here in these verses is the termination of the self-life. The termination of the self-life because the very meaning of that word constraineth, look at it, the very meaning of that in verse 14, it means, it's a beautiful word, but it means confined within the limits of certain course of action which never deviates from one set purpose. That word constrains mean that Paul said the love of Christ constrains me. I love him so much and he loves me so much that I cannot help but to go straight forward toward him. Now, I believe that's the same thing that Jesus was talking about in Luke chapter 12 and verse number 50 when he, he uses that word uh, in his baptism. He said, but I have been ba a baptism to be baptized with and how am, I how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Jesus used the word straighten, which means the same thing as constraineth, and he uses that. And we say, well, what's Jesus mean when he was saying that? Jesus said, I'm going to Calvary. I'm setting my face like a flint toward Calvary. Nothing's going to steer me off course. My mission is to die for the sins of the world. Now we see this word constrain, it's a, it's a great word and for him it meant the path of the cross even unto death that he might be raised to the glory of God the Father. In this extinguishing uh, and termination of the old self we see number one, the extinguishing of the old self. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20 Paul, again the writer, the same writer in 2 Corinthians now he's in Galatians he says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is one of the greatest discoveries in all of the Bible. When Jesus died at Calvary, he not only died for us, but we died with him. Can I say that again? When Jesus died at Calvary, he not only died for us, but we died with him. This means the termination of the self life. Let me illustrate. When you are a born in another country but yet you want to become a citizen of the United States of America, there has to be a few things that happens. Not just anyone can just come into the country and say, I want to be a citizen. There's a process but you come as a citizen of the country, the first thing you must do is renounce all of your commitments and allegiances to the country you're coming from. You have to. You cannot say, well, I, I'm going to still have my allegiance toward this other country, but I want to become a citizen of yours. That's not how it works. When you pledge to become a citizen of the United States of America, you must pledge your 100% allegiance to the United States. Then and only then will the U.S. government grant you citizenship. That's the way it is with Jesus. 
the exact same way because when you accept Christ as Savior and you ask Him, Lord, I want you to, to come in my life and I want you to save me, what you're saying is, Lord, I want you to save me. Uh, I don't want to go to hell, but you're also renouncing sin. Amen. You're renouncing Satan. You're renouncing self. The Bible says you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. You know what most society today is saying is, is, is they go to church when it's convenient. They serve God when it's convenient. Well, you know, if I don't have nothing to do this weekend, I'll come to church. Hold on a second. Who are you serving? What are you a citizen of? Man, this is where we come and worship God. This is where we come and, and, and lift the name of Jesus. This is where we come and hear the word of God preached. And you're going to, well, if I have it in my schedule... You understand that we are the bride of Christ. And where two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be in the midst. Man, I tell you what, I wake up on Sunday mornings, this old body sometimes doesn't feel like coming to church, but this old spirit inside, hey, it's like an old war horse, man. It can't wait to get in behind the pulpit and preach the wonderful works of God and the Word of God and be with the people of God and be in fellowship. Hey, when I leave church on Sunday night, I'm exhausted, but I'm thankful because I put the Lord first. Hey, what a great thing. Listen, if we're a citizen of that far country, I'm talking about that land that's greater and fairer than day, my friend, it will have joy bells in your soul and your spirit. You'll want to be in church every time you possibly can. We see the, the extinguishing of the old self life. Then we see the relinquishing of the new self. You say, what do you mean? Well, Notice that in verse in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He also says in, in 2 Corinthians 5.15, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. There's the relinquishing of the new self because it says, but unto him which died for them and rose again. We're not to live for self, we're to live for him. That's the new life. When the old self which represented the past was extinguished at Calvary, the new self comes in which represents a redeemed personality had to be yielded to Christ in order to complete his response to the constraining love of Christ. See, Calvary does not obliterate the real you and me. Having been delivered from our old selves, the question arises as to what we're to do with our old or with our new selves. But I believe it's, it's found in verse 15. But unto him which died for them and rose again, wherefore henceforth know we know man after the flesh, yea, that though uh, we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. I believe that we cannot kneel before the cross and recognize the wonder of the self-giving of the Lord Jesus without exclaiming, as the songwriter did, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. See, when you're in love with Jesus, this old self fades away. Man, everything you demand, listen, demands my soul, my life, my all. That means when he comes knocking on your heart's door and says, hey, I want you to do this for me, you're not going to fight him. Doesn't mean you're always going to like it. Doesn't mean that you're always going to understand it. But it does mean that when he has your life, when he has everything that you have and, and really everything you've got belongs to him, and, and, and when he comes knocking on the heart door and says, I, I need you to do this for me, you'll say, here my Lord, send me. I'm telling you, we joke sometimes about, man, I about surrender to the mission field. You know what I mean? When you get scared or when you're having to repent and when you're having to... Uh, there have been uh, me and my wife wrote a, uh, one of these things in Gatlinburg years ago. We took the teenagers to Gatlinburg, and y'all ever drove into Pigeon Forge and you see them big spinning things? Y'all ever seen them big things at night? They got the blue lights. I mean, way up in there, and they're spinning. Them things have to be a death trap. Have to be. You know they ain't tested them things. It's Pigeon Forge. It's everything there scary. Just about. And we uh, we got in one of them things, and man, you can see the whole you, you can see the whole city. And we got in and we just ate out back. I mean, I'm talking about we just ate. And she's like, hey, you want to go do this? And I said, yeah. 
and the teens in the back, you know, and they're like, yeah, that'd be great, you know, let's watch it. Man, we got in there and they strap you in and the guy strapped me in and said, yeah, the last guy we had, the seatbelt broke, you know, and he kind of like, <laughs> he was lying, you know, I, I, I was hoping he was. Remember, he was giving us a hard time and so we got in there and Man, that thing took us up to the top of the, and I'm up there, and it dangles you up there a little bit, and all of a sudden it starts. Buddy, let me tell you, it starts, and I'm like, ah! And, you know, at the time, and I'm up there surrendering to everything, <laughs> confessing sin, scream, and they're videoing it, you know, because you get a video at the end of it. And, uh, and I'm up there, and she's laughing at me because I'm dying. And uh, then uh, we get up there to the top, and then I think it's over. They bring us down, and all of a sudden he says, now we're going backwards. And man, we went backwards. And I'm and when we got done, I was mad. I was mad at her. I was mad at me for being as dumb to get in that thing. And uh, then I went over and laid in the grass <laughs> and vomited my head off. And the teens are over going, "Ooh, yeah, you know, just giving me a tough time. And, uh, you know, though I was up there, and we, we joke about stuff like that. Oh, yeah, I was surrendering to this. But in reality... When Jesus really does come and, and speaks to us and maybe while we're reading our Bible, while someone's preaching and God starts pricking that heart of yours saying, hey, you need to do this. How receptive are we? Yeah, but God, you don't know what I've done. I just got this job promotion. Or I just did this. We just built this home. Or we just did this. God, why are you come picking on me? Hold on a second. If you die to self, that's not going to be your spirit. See, if it's not all about self, you're going to be willing to do whatever because it's love so amazing. I, I, the love of Christ constraineth me. And when you truly love Him and you're bound to Him and there's no uh, going to the left or the right, you love Him. Hey, guess what? That love is what will keep you in tune with Him and dying to self. It demands my soul, my life, my all. I think the second thing we see is not only the termination of the self-life, but we see the introduction of the faith life. Because look at verse 16. The Bible says, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become New. I believe Paul shows us in these two verses how his determination to live for Christ rather than self found expression in the faith life. The Bible says about faith, without faith it's impossible to please God. So if we don't have a faith life, can we ask the question, is our life pleasing to Him? Hey, that's a good question for us to ask this morning. Is your life and is my life pleasing to Him? If you are living for self, I got news for you this morning. If you're living for self, if it's all about you, that's not pleasing to God. It's all about you. What's in it for me? You ever heard that? What's in it for me? Well, hey, well, what's in it for me, preacher? Hey, what's in it for me, dad? Hey, what's in it for me? Hey, have we asked that to God? Now, God, if you, if you send me here, what's in it for me? Oof. Boy, that's a, that's a selfish statement, but you would be surprised that when you don't die to self and when you are living in those past things and you've not accepted this faith life, if you will, you can, you can be awful selfish because to be united to Christ through His death and resurrection is to gain new standards of judgment and new ways of looking at things. Look at verse 16 again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we Him no more. I believe when we get saved and that faith life comes in and we're a new creature in Christ and old things are passed away, guess what? We start looking at things differently. We start looking at people differently. Paul, of course, we remember him as Saul before he got saved. You know, you realize that Saul literally held the garments while they stoned one of the most Holy Spirit filled men in the Bible. Held the garments as they watched them men hurl boulders and stones as they fractured the skull and literally uh, uh, damaged and beat Stephen and he died and listen Paul was there he, he saw it all happen and he was there and watched it all but then God had a plan even then 
think about what Paul changed. Paul had ceased to judge men by the outward appearance and circumstances of life, such as color, wealth, rank, culture, knowledge. The one question that mattered to him was whether man, by his own act or choice, had become a new creation through the death and resurrection of Christ. See, before Jesus was nothing more to Paul than a history, uh, historical figure, a man who went through obscurity, lived in restricted surroundings, died a humiliated death because of evaluation of Jesus. He, dimiss, he dismissed Jesus as an imposter and persecuted his church. You think about what Paul thought about Jesus before salvation and what he thought about Jesus after salvation. His view changed, didn't it? How's your view this morning of people? Hey, can I ask you a question, church? And this is where I dwelt for the most part this morning in our service. And I want you to listen. What's your view of people? Can I tell you, if you're living for self, I can tell you what your view of people most of the time is. There's only a certain group of people you like being around. We call them cliques. They scratch your back. They make you feel good. They, you like being around them because that, that's your people. But when you're living for Jesus, every person matters. See, when we're spirit-filled and we've denied self, race does not matter. You know, why does it have to be church that in, in society it's just kind of the way it is? It shouldn't be, but it's the way it is because we're so carnal and wicked. Today society is so wicked. But why does it have to be over there is the white church and over there is the black church? Because we have lived for self too long. We look through our eyes at a man and judge him by his outward appearance. But guess what can I tell you? You know what Jesus did and God's work has always done? He's always started from the inside out. Any time in the Bible that you see where God did something, He always started on the inside, the sinner, and worked His way out to the edge. And you know what? That's where salvation starts, right? It's the inside. It's the heart. The soul. It's where we get saved and on the inside things start transforming. See, what the Pharisees were interested in was on the outside. The Pharisees wanted the outside cleaned up. So, you know, they would look at a person and they would judge them by how they looked or how they dressed or what they did. You know, when they prayed, remember how they prayed? They prayed openly with their chest bowed out and their eyes to heaven and they were really loud when they prayed and they prayed out in the open. But that ain't how we're supposed to pray. Not like that. Boastful. and When we pray, the Bible tells us in Matthew that we should go in a closet and shut the door. Now, I'm not against public praying, but you understand what I'm saying. If that's the only time you ever pray, I wonder about that. Why are we so interested in what someone looks like on the outside? Now, hold on a second. Here's what I believe. I believe if the inside is right, the outside will reveal itself. Amen. It'll correct itself. Hey, if that heart gets right with God, hey, I've watched people get saved, and listen, all of a sudden, uh, without even hitting areas really in the Bible, uh, even though we ought to preach the whole council, without even really getting on one area uh, of where maybe they are at, they all of a sudden come to me or come to the preacher and say, man, I, I just, I don't feel the same about this anymore. I, I used to do this, but preacher, I don't know. I just, every time I go to do that now, I just don't feel right. You know who that is? It's the Holy Spirit. And guess what? You, they're doing something. Listen, they're doing something that it's a supernatural change. It's not, hey, you know what I'm so sick of? I'm so sick of people changing for the pastor. Because if you change for me or any other man of God or any other person or any other preacher, if you change for them, guess what? You're just going to go back to it. That's not going to last. But if you change for him and it's a change that's sincere, that's what lasts. We see a faith life accepts a new creation 
accepts a new conception of man. But number two, I believe this faith life accepts a new creation of man. Look at verse 17. This is a famous verse we've quoted quite a bit. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new creature. Say it one more time. He's a what? New creature. A created thing. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. No thoughtful man or woman can understand this verse in our contemporary world and not be persuaded by the relevance and validity of our gospel. This is the essence of our Christian faith right here, a faith that accepts a new conception of man and a new creation of man because Jesus Christ has made all things new. I can't save no one in here. If I could save people, man, I'd just be out here all day just saving people. Man, you're saved whether you like it or not. You're saved, you're saved, you're saved. The only one that can save is Jesus. The only one that can change a man, a real change, is Jesus. You know, I preach in a church in Georgia every year. Every I'm in the state of Georgia quite a bit preaching. There's a lot of good churches in North Georgia especially. And uh, there's one particular church. I just love going to it every year. And there's a woman that sits over here to my right. And the whole time I preach, the whole time the choir sings, the whole time someone's singing, she is over here weeping and shouting the whole time. She'd make most people nervous. You know what I mean? I mean, she's just one of them wa wavy, uh, hanky waving, old time Bab uh, Baptist shouting. And it, I, I love her. She's a great spirit. I love being around her. She just loves God. One night before revival years ago, I said, Ma'am, I need to talk to you after the service. Because I've been going to this church now for nine, I think nine or ten years now. And I asked her, I said, Ma'am, I've got to talk to you. I, I, there's a question that's been bugging me the last few. She said, what's that? She was all nervous that I was asking her a question. She said, well, what did I do? I said, nothing. I said, I just got to ask you, why in the world are you happy every time you come to church? Now, she comes by herself. I said, every time you come to church, you're the happiest person in the building. It is obvious. We'll be singing, and over there you look, and she's smiling and crying. I'm talking about on the first stanza. We just got to church. That's, you know, kind of warm up, you know. It's, it's just, we're getting there. It shouldn't be, but that's the way it is. She, and we're all kind of, hey, you know, let's get together. Let's all stand and let's sing. She's already plugged in. And I'm thinking, that ain't normal. And I finally asked her, and she said, huh, it stumped her for a little bit. She said, I, I don't really know. I really don't know. I'm just happy. I said, man, that's amazing. The next night I was preaching, she said, preacher, I've got an answer for you. And she said, can I tell you? And I said, what's that? And she said, well, she said, I used to be a grocery, a grocery store uh, cashier down at the Winn-Dixie. How many of you remember Winn-Dixie? Lord, that was a good store. Yeah. It was at the Winn-Dixie. She said, I used to be bagging groceries there and ringing people up. She said, a, a, a man came through the line one night, and I was about to get off work, and he handed me a gospel track and invited me to church. She said, I took that track. She said, little did he know... Uh, what I was living in. She said, Preacher, she said, I'd drink. I'd done lost. I'd been through two marriages. And she said, I was a mess. A mess. I took that track and went home and I looked on the back of it and it, it was a church name. She said, I'm going to try that Sunday. I'm not working Sunday. I'm going to be there Sunday. And she drove down to that church that Sunday morning and heard a gospel preacher preach and she walked the aisle and got saved. She said, Preacher, she said, as soon as I got saved, she said, something happened in me. She said, man, I used to be depressed and I'd be down and I'd be defeated. She said, I, I was cranky, I was irritable, I was upset, I was depressed. All these things that was going on in my life. She said, I, I went to work and it was different. I, I went to uh, different places, family members, and it was different. Everything was different. She said, I didn't know what had happened to me, but I just could not help but smile. She said, Preacher, I started coming. She said, I don't miss nothing. She said, I mean, every time they announce something at the church, whether it pertains to me or not, she said, I'm here at youth meetings half the time. And I said, ma'am, that's wonderful. She's been safe for years now. 
She said, Preacher, I'll tell you what, I get all stirred up before church. She said, when I pull my car out of the driveway, I start driving down the road. She said, I'll see that beer joint that I used to pull into. I'll drive by and see them old friends I used to hang around. She said, then I drive on down. She said, there it comes to another beer joint on the left. She said, by the time I get to church, I've done past three beer joints where I used to pull in and drink. She said, but I don't do that anymore. She said, I pull into church, and by the time I pull into church, I'm already crying. I'm already stirred up. Hey, can I tell you, that was an old creature. Hey, that, uh, listen, got saved and become a new creature. Old things were passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We see the operation of the Christ life. Because in verse 19 and 20, and even 21, and I'll end with this, Brother Jacob, you come. It says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed us unto, notice, unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, by ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, when a person has experienced the termination of the self-life and they're introduced to the faith life, then Christ now becomes the central of all their actions and all their conduct. You say, what do you mean? Well, verse 19 has a little phrase in there that God was in Christ and He's reconciling the world unto Himself. See, church, look at me. The reason all this is so important is not just to save us from hell. Not just so that we can be happy. There is a world to reach. We're saved to serve. See, that's what he said in verse 19. Paul says, To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. There's a world to reach. There, there's something even greater than what we can ever imagine. From the divine perspective, God did everything to break down the enmity and the hostility of sin which separated man from God. But you and I also play a role in this ministry of reconciliation. Because our task is to reach a world that has been reconciled to God through this death of His Son. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says that we've been commissioned. We're to go and reach and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. We're supposed to reach them Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. You say, why is it so important? Because there's a world to reach and there's a word to preach. Because in verse number 20, it tells us we have a message that is distinctive and dynamic. See, Paul said in Romans 1.16, Church, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God. All we do is if we sit and say, well, preacher, I'm not the man that I used to be and thank God that I don't do that stuff anymore and that I'm a new creature in Christ. Well, good, that's great. Glad, I'm happy for you. Thank God. But what are you doing? What are you doing to tell somebody else? See, that's a great testimony to walk around and say, man, I used to be this, I used to be that. Now, hey, look, I, don't, I can't really go around and say a whole lot about what I used to be other than just a lost teenage boy on his way to hell, but some of you's got a testimony of what God saved you out of that could help so many people. Reach the world, preach the word. Folks, can I tell you, an ambassador is not a man who communicates his own opinions and speculations. See, you see that in verse 20? Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. Y'all see that? An ambassador is not a man who communicates his own opinions or speculations, but speaks with authority and a name of his government. 
We have nothing for which to apologize. Our message comes from God himself. And so with apostolic boldness, we preach the word with confidence and courage, yet with divine humility. We need to preach that message. See, all of you in here, not everyone, maybe, I'm not sure, but there's a lot of you in here today that would say, Preacher, I know I got saved. But have you ever told anybody else? I know it's I know it's quiet. But if you're not doing something and telling somebody else, then we're not really fulfilling the Great Commission. It's not just good enough for you to be saved. Is your family saved? Is your neighbor saved? Is that person you work with saved? Have you witnessed to them? Have you given them a gospel track? Have you lived a life that is pleasing to God that they they would even know that you got what you got's real. Are you living a different way through the week than you are on Sunday? Kind of like the Coca-Cola commercial years ago, I've got the real thing. Do you have the real thing this morning? Salvation.